Good morning. For those of you who may not know who I am, my name is Hunter Smith. I am a student studying to be a pastor at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, and it is my privilege to lead you in worship this morning. We'll begin our worship by singing our opening hymn, hymn 916. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. 
for the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully hear our prayers. Be gracious to us in our weakness, and give us strength to keep your commandments in all we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first reading for this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verses 12 through 23. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. And Moses said, Now show me your glory. 
And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. This is the word of our God. Amen. Amen. Our second reading for this morning comes from the letter to the Romans, chapter 7, verses 15 through the first half of verse 25. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of our God. Amen. Amen. We'll continue by singing the hymn of the day, hymn 555.
for this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen him and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. What more do you need, Thomas? Is that what you think? Do you think that Thomas was being unreasonable by demanding that Jesus prove to him he had indeed risen from the dead? Or maybe do you think that Thomas and the other disciples had every reason to believe that a dead man would stay dead? Every reason to think that they were completely surrounded by their enemies, who wanted to hurt them just as violently as they had Jesus, their leader. Well, regardless of what we think about this incident, Thomas and the other disciples doubted some paramount promises of God, just as you and I sometimes do. But Jesus proved that he is indeed alive. And the proof of that has been written down right here for us to know and believe in it, even without seeing Jesus for ourselves. But before Jesus appeared to those disciples, we find them cowering behind locked doors, afraid, as if the Almighty God isn't strong enough to shield them from their enemies. And they weren't just diminishing God's protection by holding up in that room. But they were completely dismissing Jesus' own promise to them that he would rise again from the dead. They should have been camped right outside the tomb with a fresh change of clothes, maybe some food, eagerly awaiting the moment that their Savior would walk right out to them. But instead, they locked down. And then the Gospel of Luke tells us that even when Jesus miraculously appeared in that room with them, they thought it was a ghost until Jesus proved to them that he was real. And then these same disciples, they guaranteed their dear friend Thomas that the living, breathing Jesus had kept his promise. Obviously, just as God keeps all of his promises. But Thomas thought that raising Jesus from the dead was too much for God to accomplish. 
the disciples assured Thomas that their own eyes had seen the risen Lord. But Thomas called his friends, called his Savior, liars. For Thomas, God's word, God's promises, they weren't enough. Thomas demanded the evidence that he wanted, wounds that he could see, that he could feel with his own hands, or else he wouldn't believe. Isn't it also so easy for us to doubt the promises of God when we can't stare right at them with our eyes, when we can't grab them in our hands? God guarantees you that he is going to see to your every need. But do you always believe that? At least until you can feel the weight of the groceries in your cart, or see those numbers in your bank account. And God promises me that he hears me. Whenever I beg to him to help me, to help someone that I care deeply about, but do I sometimes convince myself that God must be deaf unless he does exactly what I want, when I want it, in the way I wanted it to happen? And how often, even though we have God's promise that his church is going to endure until Christ returns again, how often do we panic about the future of that church? That panic only being quelled by seeing another baby get baptized or shaking the hand of a new person at our congregation. It is incredibly easy to doubt the promises of God when we can't see them and when we can't feel them. And doubt poisons us so deeply that it's not just God's promises that we doubt, but it's the entirety of His words sometimes. God has taken ownership of Scripture. He's guaranteed you that every bit of it is from Him. But do you always treat every part of the Bible as if it's God's own message in all that you do every single day? Jesus has labeled the entire Bible as truth. But might I sometimes be tempted to determine for myself what parts are true? what parts I'm not so sure about. And perhaps the most frightening times when it comes to doubt are when your doubt doesn't really seem to have any boundaries at all. The constant suffering of this life might make you think that God doesn't love you. Or your never-ending screw-ups day in and day out might lead you down the path of believing that God could never call you his child. Or the deafening hatred of the world around you toward God and toward his people might convince you that Jesus never came out of that grave. And so often with our doubt, we, like Thomas, demand evidence from God where he has not offered it. And we make that a condition of our belief. We say, God, give me something that I can see, something that I can feel, and then I'll... The poison of doubt has always been one of Satan's favorite weapons. And I'm certain that you've tasted that poison just as I have. But Jesus, he meets doubt head on proof. When the disciples were convinced that that man miraculously standing in a locked room with them was a ghost, Jesus showed them real wounds on a real body. The very same body that had been dead in a grave not long before them. And they were ecstatic because God was alive right in front of their eyes. And when Thomas treated the words of his friends and of his Lord like misinformation. When he demanded that the creator of the universe give him the evidence that he wanted, Jesus did. Jesus had Thomas 
feel the crucifixion with his own fingertips and said, believe. And in that very moment, Thomas realized that his fingers touched the God who created the world, who created Thomas, and who died for Thomas and for the whole world. He says, my Lord and my God. When Thomas and the other disciples doubted the word and the promises of God, God pointed them to the cross, to his identity there, to the wounds that he suffered out of love for them. And the cross is precisely the proof that God constantly gives to us as well. When we doubt God's word and his promises, when we doubt whether God really is who he says he is, he points to the cross. The whole Bible points to that cross, to who he is. You wonder whether God will provide for your needs. And then you see that God has provided his son for your greatest need to pay for all of your sins and take all of your guilt away. And I question whether God hears me when I'm broken, when the people around me are broken, but then I know that God has heard, that he has answered this broken world with Christ who fixes us. And no matter how many times we may think that the church is on a deathbed and we're watching it take its final breaths right in front of our eyes, Jesus, who is the foundation of that same church, has risen from the dead and defeated Satan and everything else that fights against that church. At the cross, in the damaged hands, and side of our living, risen Redeemer, we see the proof that God has kept his most important promise to us, and therefore that he is a God who keeps his promises. He kept his promise by the resurrection, and because of that, we have peace with God. Just as Jesus says over and over again, peace be with you. That's our new existence after Christ. How could the disciples be afraid of anything anymore? When Jesus had showed them that not even death needed to be feared. Or Thomas, how could he demand anything else from God when he had the privilege to see and to feel Jesus for himself? And do you or I have any reason to worry about anything. When sin is defeated, Christ is risen, and we have mansions waiting for us in heaven. We have peace with God by the resurrection, and the promises of God live on just as Jesus does. We doubted it, certainly, but Christ proved that he is risen. He proved it before his disciples in person on that day. And then God had John and others write down that proof for everyone else to know and to believe in. God wrote <coughs> the Bible, the story of Jesus written down, not as some afterthought to keep us in the loop, but as his plan for us from all the way back when he said, let there be light at the creation of the world. And so, our doubts aren't any more legitimate than those of Thomas or the other disciples, no matter how much we may believe they are. Because for all people of all time, it's always been the Holy Spirit that puts faith in our hearts, whether that's by seeing Jesus in person or by reading about Him in the Word. My brothers and sisters, it is a lie of the devil that you lose out in any way by not getting to see Jesus person to person yet, and instead reading about him in the Bible. Jesus himself, after all, says, Blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you. 
you are blessed. Because even though you haven't seen Jesus, you love Him, you believe in Him, and it fills you with a joy that the world around you could only dream of. You are living, breathing proof that the Word of God is powerful. So powerful that it's convinced you that Jesus came to live a perfect life in your place, that he died on the cross for all of your sins, and that he rose from the dead in victory over death. And because you have faith in all of that, you and I get to be in heaven forever with our living Savior. And not only do we have that message written for us, but we get to be spotlights on that cross for the whole world around us. We get to share the story of Jesus with every other person who so desperately needs it. And we have the privilege of meeting people who are shattered in their sin and giving to them the forgiveness of Christ the beautiful forgiveness that pieces us back together again every time we're demolished by our own sin. And sharing the beautiful story of Jesus and his forgiveness with others show me a more immense purpose for the people of God. The poison of doubt is never going to leave us during our time on this earth whether that's doubting God's word or doubting any of his promises. But in the resurrection and at the cross, we see proof that God is who he says he is, that he does keep his promises, that he does love you, and that all of your sins have been forgiven. And that truth has been written down for all of us to know and believe in it even without seeing it. And it's powerful enough to make faith in the hearts of everyone who hears it. So we share it with everyone. What more do you need, child of God? Blessed are you, because even though you don't even know what his face looks like, you love your Savior Jesus. And though your fingers have not yet touched his nail-marked hands. You believe that he died to take all of your sins away. And though you cannot yet stare right into the loving eyes of your living Redeemer, you can't even express to others the joy that you have in knowing that he's alive and victorious. It has been doubted, but it's been proven, and it's been written. Christ is risen. Amen. Amen. Please stand. We'll join together in confessing our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church,
disease, accident, or loss. Lift them into your comforting arms and embrace them with the warmth of your love. Carry them through life's troubling times with new hope and joy in their lives. Eternal Shepherd, when our days on earth come to an end and we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, lead us safely to our eternal home. There we will enjoy your goodness and mercy forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right to you. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord. Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who came as the light of the world, so that the world may have light and life through Him. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing the song of singing.
who may have missed my introduction. My name is Hunter Smith. Not a full pastor yet. I'm training to be a pastor at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. And at the end of the summer, I'll be entering my second year there. Uh, but it's been a privilege to lead all of you in worship. I'm thankful to have all of you here today. Um, and I hope that you will have a blessed week in the Lord. I assume we have announcements. Yep, we have announcements. So I can read to you what's already on the screen. Uh, July 10th, knitted together, and Council of Elders meeting, Women's Morning Ministry, 8.30, July 15th. Communicator deadline, get everything in for that, uh, 8 a.m., July 16th. Otherwise, I'll be there to greet you at the door, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and week.